Okay, so today we're going to talk about theoretical exercise six, the final one this semester uh, in the theoretical exercise series. And this was all about real time systems and real time scheduling. So the first question was about earliest deadline first scheduling. So as always for scheduling algorithms, it's really important to figure out First, if all tasks can be scheduled, which means that, yeah, all tasks can actually find some time to execute on the CPU. And in addition, it means that actually all tasks should be able to schedule before their deadline. So they should be able to finish before the deadline, because if you have a hard real-time system, like whatever a uh, ABS controller, uh, an anti-lock brake system controller in your car, or something like this. If this reacts too late, you can imagine bad things are going to happen. So in our first example for EDF scheduling, uh, we have a relatively typical setups with a, a low number of jobs, like four different jobs or tasks. And each of these tasks usually has a release time. So that's the time at which the job or task becomes available here. Then it has deadline. So the point in time when this actually has to be finished. Oops, I just had the wrong tool selected here. So that's a bit messed up now, sorry for that. So we have uh, the release time in time units. So time is just split into units. And you can say this is like units of seconds or milliseconds or whatever works for your system. Uh, you have a deadline and you have the uh, amount of compute cycles that this task needs to complete. So the first one is released at uh, point 10, so it can't start before time unit 10. It has to be finished by the absolute time unit 18, so these deadlines are always given in absolute time units here, and it needs four cycles to compute. Job number two starts at zero here. Uh, it, has its deadline at 28 and needs 12 cycles. Job three starts at six, or earliest time it can start at six. It needs to be finished by 17, it needs three cycles. And job four finally starts at the earliest point in time of point three, has a deadline of 13 and needs six cycles to complete. Now earliest deadline first, as the name says, prioritizes the job that has the earliest deadline. So that is the job that is most urgently needed to re, uh, finish first. So uh, we start at point time zero. So at zero, there's only job two available. So we start job two and there's nothing happening until time three when job four becomes available. Now, job two has a deadline of 28 here. So Job four comes, becomes available, has a deadline back here of 13. So job four has the higher priority because it has the earlier deadline. So at time three, we switch over from job two to job four and job four can now start running. And at time six, job three arrives, but job three has a later deadline. So job three's deadline is uh, time 17. So job four can continue executing and only when job four has finished executing all its six time units here, then we switch over to job three, which was waiting for the CPU to become available. And job three takes three time units. Now, after its first time unit at time 10, job one becomes available, but the deadline of job one is 18 whereas the deadline of the currently running job three is 17. So job three can continue running. It can successfully execute all its three time units and then it's finished. And then we switch over to job number one. Well, this can execute its four time units because it still has a earlier deadline than job two, which was interrupted in the beginning. And only when job one has finished all its four cycles, we switch over and back to job two and now finally job two can execute its remaining cycles. That's all. So that's relatively simple to schedule jobs with EDF. You just have to consider the deadlines and you have to remember deadlines are given in absolute time units here. And then, well, it's pretty obvious what's going on, I think. 
We also had to look at a different scheduling algorithm, which was rate monotonic scheduling. So here we have a system which is comprised only of two tasks. And these tasks are periodic with rate monotonic scheduling. And uh, they have a period. So they, for example, have to be executed once every five time units for task one and once every seven time units for task two. And in this interval of five or seven time units, they take only a share of that time. So task one needs two computing time units every five units, whereas task two needs four units every seven units. Deadlines are equal to periods, that's usual. So usually uh, task one has to be finished every five time units and task two has to be finished every seven time units. And we're using rate monotonic scheduling here. So uh, the first question was, could any of the two tasks miss its deadline due to a too high processor utilization? Well, yes, that's a general problem in rate monotonic scheduling if your processor utilization is too high. Well, you can miss a deadline obviously, and so the question is really, oops, sorry, click the wrong button. The question is really, uh, what is the utilization and are we actually on the safe side here or are we risking to miss our deadline here? So we know we have this necessary uh, condition for rate monitoring scheduling for a single processor and for n tasks. The accumulated utilization uh, does, uh, is not allowed to exceed this bound here. So we take the sum of all tasks of the compute time divided by their interval. So the share they need in each interval. And if this sum is less or equal than, well, n times the nth root of two minus one, then we're on the safe side. So this on the right-hand side here for two tasks is 0.828. And on the left-hand side, we have to calculate this given our assumptions here. So two every five and four every seven. So this is two over five plus four over seven, which is about 0 0.4 plus 0 0.571, which is 0 0.971. So our utilization with this uh, task schedule here is 0 0.971. This is definitely larger than uh, 0 0.828. So Schedulability with RMS cannot be guaranteed here, which means in turn a task could miss its deadline. It doesn't necessarily mean that a task has to miss its deadline. That really depends on the configuration, uh, but we cannot guarantee that no task ever, uh, never misses its deadline. So uh, the next question was actually to generate a graphical representation of the resulting schedule with the assumption that a task will always run to completion, even if it misses its deadline. So uh, for RMS, the priority of tasks is monotonically decreasing with their period. So essentially, the larger the period, the lower the priority. So this means a task with lower priority is preempted when a task with higher priority arrives. T1 has the shorter period, so it has a higher priority and thus T1 can preempt T2. So we start with T1. It has a deadline of five time units. So every five time units, we have this symbol here of the double arrow, which means we have a deadline. That's a down pointing arrow. And we have a new job release, which is the up pointing arrow. So we combine it here. So we execute two time units in this first interval here. Then T1 has finished executing in this period here. So we can switch over to T2. But remember, T2 takes four time units, but we can only execute three time units until time five is reached. And at time five, T1 becomes ready again with its next period. So uh, T2 is preempted. It has to wait until the CPU is uh, becoming available again. So T1 executes two cycles. And here we have a problem already because then we have reached time seven but we have only executed three out of four time units for T2. So we have a deadline miss here already marked in red. So T2 actually would require an additional time unit here before it can actually continue with the task in its next period. Here it can also only execute two time units before we switch over to T1. 
Then we switch back after two time units because team one is finished for the third period here. And then we can finally execute all four time units for the second iteration of T2. And then we go on in that way. So we see that we have a deadline miss here in this very first case, but for the upcoming cases, we have no further deadline uh, violations here. So it really depends on the interference of the utilization of the task and their periods here uh, to determine if such a deadline miss actually happens or not. And of course, what we would want is we want to avoid these deadlines. So in general, when we design a system, we want to actually ensure that the utilization stays below this bound that we've calculated on the previous slide. The final question uh, related to real-time systems and embedded systems was about priority inversion. So uh, priority inversion is a difficult problem in real-time systems because you define priorities, because you want to determine the order in which tasks are executed. So here we have three tasks, A, B, and C with three priorities. A has the highest priority of one, B has a priority of three, and C has the lowest priority of five. Now tasks A and C have to synchronize because they use a shared resource. So they use semaphores here with the P and V operations we've seen with semaphores here. So when task I, A starts running, it runs for one time unit, then it executes the P operation on the semaphore here. Whenever it has successfully acquired the semaphore, it runs for two time units inside of this critical region until it releases our semaphore again using the V, op uh, v uh, operation on the semaphore, and then finally runs for another time unit until it's finished. So it takes four time units overall to execute task A, and two of these are inside of this critical section. Um, then we have activation time, so task A starts at time two. Task B is simple, it doesn't synchronize at all, it just takes five time units from start to end, but it only starts at time four. And task C also does synchronization, so it synchronizes against the same semaphore as task A, so it runs for one time unit, then also tries to acquire this uh, semaphore, then its own critical section runs for three time units, and then it releases our semaphore and runs for another time unit until it's finished. And C can start right away at time unit zero. So here, the problem is really that we hold a shared resource here. And while we hold this resource, like imagine task A would hold this resource. So it has executed P of S first. Task C has to wait and cannot continue executing until the V operation of task A has actually been executed. So this is actually the problem that even a task with a lower priority like C could acquire the semaphore first and then task A could not continue running even though it has a higher priority because it needs to wait for the semaphore to be released because we know semaphores cannot or are usually not forcibly removed from a process. So the first question here was, uh, to visualize the desired execution sequence. So the execution sequence that should actually take place if we would not consider semaphores. Well, we release C at point time uh, point zero. So C can execute for two time units until the next task is released. This is task A at time two. So then task A has the highest priority. So we switch over to task A. Task A has the highest priority, so task A runs for all of its four time units here. Uh, then it's finished, so while A was running, task B became available at time four here, so it had to wait because A had the higher priority. Now we can continue running task B here, or we can start running task B. It runs for five time units because it has a higher priority than task C. And only when task B is finished, then task C can finally execute its remaining three time units here. So here, if we ignore semaphores here, if we ignore blocking, our priority would work. The highest priority process always gets the CPU right away when it arrives. And then the lower priority tasks have to wait until the highest priority task doesn't need the CPU anymore. Now this would be without semaphores. If we have semaphores, things look a bit different. So that's where this diagram gets a bit more complicated. We start again with task C. 
and it runs for two units and we see in task C after one time unit, it acquires a semaphore or it tries to acquire the semaphore first. Since the semaphore was available because A had not been started yet, it successfully holds the semaphore and then executes for another time unit. Then task B is, uh, I see we have a bug in here, sorry. Okay, I have to fix this. I mixed up task B and task A in the diagram here. So task A would actually be starting here. So uh, for this diagram to work, assume that the starting times of B and A are switched. Sorry, I just noticed this is a mess up on my side. So if task B would be released at point in time two, it has a higher priority than task C, then it would run for two time units here until at point four, task A would start. Uh, this has a higher priority than B or C, so it gets a CPU. It runs for one time unit here. Uh, whoops, that one here on the left-hand side, uh, task A. And then it tries to acquire the semaphore. And here's where our problem starts. Because this semaphore is still held by task C, because task C needs three time units to finish its critical section, task A cannot continue here. So it has to block waiting for the semaphore here. So what happens is that the next lowest priority task becomes available, which is task B here. And this can continue running for its remaining three time units until finally task C can run again and it can actually then uh, execute the V operation to actually liberate our semaphore here. And only after that, well, that happens here actually. So after three time units here, then finally task A can run again because it has the highest priority. So it can then finally acquire its uh, semaphore it was waiting for, then it can execute the V operation after two cycles here. And then it can still continue running because it has the highest priority and only when it's finished, then task C can finally execute its final cycle here. So the, if you compare it to our previous slide, the highest priority task, which is usually the most important one is finished after time unit six here. And well, this is not directly comparable because I messed up the starting times of A and B, but we see task A is significantly delayed here. So it has to wait for much longer. So this would be problematic uh, depending on your application. So I'll fix this obviously and put an update on the slides with the correct configuration on there where the starting times of A and B are not switched. Well, sorry for that. Okay. And uh, the final question was, uh, assume that there are additional tasks with priorities between A and C, which do not access the shared resource. So no semaphores. So different tasks that look like task B here, uh, which are somewhere between A and C. And the question here was, how long would this high priority task be delayed in the worst case? Now for this example, we've given, well, they can delay the execution of task C further. So the absolute point in time at which C actually releases the semaphore S would be delayed here. So in our example here, A could be delayed for an arbitrary amount of time. Well, that's all about real-time scheduling. And the good news about real-time scheduling is this will actually not be part of the exam. I've decided because we have quite a lot of material to cover that real-time scheduling like we've discussed here uh, is not part of the exam, but I'll, uh, give details next week when we discuss the example exam. So I'll hand out the example exam later today and uh, you can work on this in your own time. And next week I'll uh, give details on which parts of the lecture are not relevant for the exam, which in turn means that everything that is not explicitly excluded from the exam may be part of the exam, obviously. Okay, so that's all from my side for today. And I'll stop recording.